Hello, everyone. I'm Juliette Riscala. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for SalPoint, and I'm very excited today to uh, welcome to Identity Talks um, a very special guest. Uh, Paul DeGraff is actually now uh, a SalPoint employee, joined us very, very recently, but he has been a customer of uh, SalPoint for many years. Actually, I don't even know how many years, Paul, um, but probably uh, close to 10. And um, Paul has a very unique perspective on identity, having been worked with it for, uh, for so many years, not just with Cellpoint, but in his career. So I thought that was really, really interesting to have him come and share a little bit his perspective on this notion of identity security, moving from a governance um, focus to a security focus for what we call identity security now. So Paul, um, thank you for joining us. We're very happy to have you first at Cellpoint and on this program. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell, uh, uh, and tell our audience, um, you know, what you've done, where you come from, and all the good stuff about you that makes you so special and such an expert on identity. Cool. Thanks, Julia, for having me, kind of. Uh, so I've been uh, a long career. So you can see the gray hairs are there. Uh, so I've been 40 years in IT, about 35 of that in security. <laughs> and had the pleasure of doing uh, many different things in security, starting back into operations, through engineering, um, even being an author, wrote a couple of books on security with various other folks and uh, did some ethical hacking in my days and made, made quite a name for myself there, <laughs> if you will. And then had the opportunity to become a, a CISO for uh, two financial services companies and more recently for um, what's now known as WW, leading their security practice and ending up in uh, leading the identity program uh, there. Kind of. So uh, so that's in a nutshell what we've done right. in the last 40 years. So, and, and that's what I like about you is that you're coming with really the perspective of um, being a CISO in those companies, right? And your, uh, your journey with identity has not been um, the same. Uh, along, along the year, obviously, identity um, governance was very different 10 years ago than what it is to, uh, today. So tell us a little bit about the evolution of identity governance, aka identity security, or vice versa. Um, because what I'm trying to um, uh, show to the audience, or we're trying to explain, mm -hmm. is that um, we're really talking about security now and less about governance. But this didn't happen overnight. Tell us a little bit um, from your perspective um, how um, using it to, you know, for uh, uh, for your organization and you've seen that evolution and what it makes so much sense to you uh, as we you and I have talked about uh, sure. many times. Sure, sure. So, um, <laughs> so identity goes back a long time, but the the first engagement with SailPoint was back in two thousand eight when I was the global CISO for AIG, and uh, we were sort of in the aftermath of the Enron scandals, and uh, AIG specifically had some problems with the New York Attorney General that caused some pain, kind of. Uh, so everything was really compliance focused, you know, getting our auditors, external auditors were on our backs to get all these business processes in place and making sure we had the right controls in place, which, um, was a big challenge with the massive undertaking. AIG was a large organization. Uh, at the time, it was well over 120,000 people, 4,000 applications. So uh, anything that was anything financial was a large amount of applications. So the main focus there was first to really get access certification on the control, understanding who had access to what, and, and certifying access. So very you know, compliance driven, if you will. That was sort of the, the take right after the whole Enron debacle. Everybody was on the, the bandwagon to sort of get control over who had access to what and making sure that that was managed uh, appropriately. And then sort of, you know, after the, the compliance efforts, it became more, you know, how do we enable people to have access to, to applications kind of. And um, so that's how it sort of matured, but then, Sort of looking back now in 2014, when I joined uh, WW, 
the world had changed completely. If, so uh, WW for audience, Weight Watchers, right? It's a new name for Weight people Watchers. People know, yeah. know Weight Watchers more to work with the they, full They name. definitely do. Yes, they definitely do that. <laughs> but very different model than very AI use a very global different. bank, right? Um, and uh, and uh, one thing that um, we may want to point out is uh, Weight Watchers was, was uh, SaaS first, right? Very much so, yeah. We had very much a cloud first strategy kind of, uh, even in 2014 already we were on the, <clears throat> we saw the opportunity that the cloud provided. And so when we looked at solutions out there, there weren't many SaaS solutions yet that did IGA kind of, right? It was basically some of our competition at the time was very much a hosted solution. You know, they said, hey, we have a cloud solution, but it really was just a hosted solution of what they did on prem. And, and the other thing when we looked at sort of the SaaS world was sort of, you know, I, I said this to SailPoint many times, Sky, it was like, not many companies get to redo their solution, if you will, kind of, right? So SailPoint grew up with an on-prem solution and moving to the cloud. It wasn't like, okay, let's move what we have to the cloud, but really rethinking of how a SaaS solution uh, should work and, and, and what are the features of the cloud solution. So, that really appealed to me again, kind of, uh, to really see that forward looking uh, vision kind of, uh, and, and really helping us uh, address that, uh, the issues that we had at the time. So where it was sort of compliance driven initially with AIG at WW was all about enablement. How do we get our employees effective day one? Kind of, how do we do that? How do we put the process in place? Still, you know, with some governance, of course, kind of, but it was really around enablement, kind of. Now. Very, very much enablement. Right. So that day one, they come in and they have access to the services that they need or as much as the services they need, whether it was automatically provisioned through our policy framework or whether it was self-service, it really was enabling employees to be productive uh, as more than, and then, you know, we still had to do the typical compliance stuff because of the regulations that are out there, but it was really, more broader looking at how do you do that enablement of employees and contractors and business partners, giving them the right access um, versus the, the compliance stake, if you will. You were running identity for Weight Watchers. Uh, uh, remind us how big was your organization in terms of users and application and how many people you had in your staff to run identity? Sure, so that was actually quite a big difference between when we looked initially at a SaaS solution, uh, it was really around how simple is that solution? How many people do I need to manage that? Kind of. So um, the organization was about 23,000 people back in the day. We had about probably, yeah, how many, user, how many applications? About 300, 400 applications, if you will. Uh, a lot of them were SaaS services, uh, if you will. So a complete different set than like an AIG with 120,000, 4,000 applications, completely different mindsets are a lot easier. Uh, but the, the management of the actual program, we were a team of three. I had two engineers in my team that really was focused on that. And it wasn't that you needed developer level skills, kind of the, this, the solution was really quite simple. And that really what, what was appealing to us kind of uh, at the time to sort of build a solution that really doesn't require a lot of handholding and mm -hmm. doesn't require deep technical skills kind of uh, to do that. So that was really uh, one, of the, one of the other major reasons why we chose SailPoint at the time. Right. Yeah, and I wanted you to say that because we talk a lot, I mean, the whole topic of this chat together is to talk about the evolution of identity governance into identity security. But I want the audience to really understand as well how much more simple we've made the solution. Identity governance, you know, when you started with it, it was kind of clunky and, you know, it was a large implementation and you needed a big staff. Uh, but this is not the case anymore, right? Uh, it could be because um, machine learning is helping us do things that people were doing, but it's also because we revamped totally the solution. We didn't take an old solution and put it in the cloud. We really looked at um, different best practice on how to do things. So it is not what people may think a huge undertaking, but it is something that is critical for the security infrastructure. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, 
one of the things we did not discuss, but sort of, you know, in the vein of keeping it simple, kind of, I think a lot of people with the capabilities that we had now before when we looked at 2014, when we first started down this journey with identity now, um, the key thing about what AI and ML can do now, it, it sort of flips the whole implementation cycle on its head. Because now you can say, you know, implement the solution, build your connectivity to your key systems and let AI ML determine what those policies and those roles are and let them just discover it all and tell you what it should be kind of right where before, I mean, I hate to say it, but it was sort of a guessing game. <laughs> kind of, you, you sort of thought what people needed to have access to based on what you saw. Kind of, so you built your roles around that, but was that really perfect? No, probably not. But now actually, you know, AI ML can go in and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. There's 80 people here. This is the role. This is what sort of the overlap is. So that expedites the implementation cycle of a, an, I, mm -hmm. an IDA program so much, kind of, that was before was never feasible. So the ROI is there straight away, kind of, where before maybe it was an implementation of six months, a year to get that into play. Now, probably you could expedite that so much faster. Kind of. So for organizations that are now looking at that, should really reconsider what their implementation is, kind of how they look upon that with these new capabilities that we now have. So when did you see the focus becoming more security and what was the trigger um, for that notion of identity governance becoming more of a security solution? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I mean, sort of coming back to the enablement piece. So normally the way it was that IT was sort of uh, slowing everything down, kind of, right? Um, what we really saw at WW that we sort of had, our integrations were very fast to connect to things. So one of the things we did was, for example, rolling out Google to the whole organization, the G Suite uh, solutions. And, you know, once we had that connectivity established and put the right controls around that, for us, it was a push of the button to basically give the whole company access. So seeing that switch from, you know, being difficult, it takes us a long time to do things, now switching over to like a push of a button to sort of provision the uh, organization, gave the company a whole completely different perspective. They were really flabbergasted, what, but you're ready already? <laughs> and all these other things needed to happen, kind of. So the security switch was really, people were beginning more and more to understand that identity became the underpinning of everything we did kind of whether that was rolling out Google or other services, people were quickly realizing that identity needed to have its own focus and part of that security is swear. So management quickly realized that they sort of needed to give it more attention. And basically we build out an identity organization and that's how I moved over into the identity space because it really, you know, security sometimes has this uh, no notion on it, kind of with identity, people could see the benefits, right? So it was clearly how you enabled an organization to do things faster. And um, yeah, really uh, getting good feedback on what you're able to do for the organization. So the, mm -hmm. the security switch sort of, people just saw it overnight kind of that, hey, this, this is important, right? Anything we needed to do was really, um, you know, identity driven, if you will. Yeah, in a way, giving access so fast, so easily to a lot of people kind of was a compelling argument to say, well, you know, maybe we should look into it and make, make sure it's secure because we're opening so many doors to the organization with that wide access. And I think what um, you've seen at Weight Watchers, a lot of people started realizing it um, when uh, when the world shut down with with the pandemic, right? So Absolutely. Um, it was basically you know something that you've seen at at the uh, because of your strategy, right? You you had seen it, but a lot of companies that were going a little bit more slower um, when uh, when the pandemic hit and everybody had to go remote, it was all about giving access to everybody super fast, so people will stay productive but opening doors for risk and, um, and compromise um, uh, account a little bit everywhere. And, and we've seen customers 
switching to that notion almost overnight. Yeah, yeah, we were very fortunate guys. So the company was very leading edge and maybe sometimes bleeding edge, if you will, in adopting new technology. So one of the benefits that we had was that in the year before we had already implemented a, a zero trust architecture to allow people to basically work from anywhere and, and get the access that they needed. So having cell point in that ecosystem was very important from a provisioning perspective and making sure that people had the right access so that fit up nicely. So when COVID hit, for us, it really was like business as usual from giving people access. Yes, there were things like um, people were using a BYOD device because they left their uh, laptop in the office, things like that. But from a pure day-to-day -day operations, things didn't change that much for the average person. Where we had the most impact was, you know, Weight Watchers had a lot of retail stores that we had to close. So all of a sudden it was like, how do we provide the same kind of service in the digital world? And we were on that transformation anyway. So then it became like, how fast can we switch from sort of a, an in-store experience to a digital experience? And the company actually accomplished that within seven days, we switched to a full virtual digital experience. And Salesforce was a clear supporter of that in that enabling that switch within that short time, giving people access to that digital environment was uh, key to the success of switching the company kind of uh, to that digital experience. And, um, you know, really with the, the, the whole pandemic, if you will, it, it just shows to people how much you need kind of that, what I call the identity fabric of capabilities to enable these kind of things so that the, the organization mm -hmm. can react faster, you can roll out new products faster, and that's key in this world. Kind of. Right. So uh, that evolution uh, is fascinating, right? We went from a, a very heavy compliance uh, focus um, to more of an enablement without having the compliance going away, but you know, becoming more of a secondary, and now the security of that create an enablement. So it's kind of something that keeps on piling up. But for, sec for, for identity um, uh, security, aka identity governance, to be able to adapt like that, we also needed to adapt the solution, right? And we're seeing a lot of um, uh, technology around AI and machine learning. And a lot of people may say, oh, that's buzzword, because it's true. There's a lot of high tech companies that are doing that. but um, you you were um, uh, using those uh, uh, those capabilities, right? Um, explain a little bit how that was a necessary evolution of the solution in order to be able to go and evolve with the business. Yeah, I mean, the, we were an early adopter of the uh, AI and L capabilities, and really, what it brought to us, like at some stage, you can't hire enough people. To, to manage all this, right? The, the data, the amount of identity data. The big that data of identity, in, right? It, it is just too much. So you need some solutions to help you manage that and sort of let the humans deal with what I call the exception stuff, kind of, but the basic day-to-day -day stuff, kind of, uh, that's where AI and ML can in. And also, you know, as organizations grow and bring more systems into this whole identity ecosystem, what was happening is that, you know, there is just fatigue in the organization. Managers were like, why do I need to do this again? Kind of, why do I need to certify this access? I did it already three times in the last year. Nothing has changed. Why are you asking me to do these things, right? So using AI and L initially maybe to make recommendations kind of around access and whether that's an approval for giving access or in the case of certifications, telling them, yeah, this is okay to approve and then morphing that eventually into more of an automated way of, of doing that is a key functionality. So for now it was like, okay, we can help making you the right decision so that managers are at least encouraged by that so that they're not know. Because a lot of managers don't necessarily know what everybody has access to and what, them, right. but then giving that information rubber, to them rubber stamping really there. helps. The other thing yeah. I think that is very important is uh, sort of, as you mentioned, uh, earlier is kind of like, you know, are we doing over provisioning kind of, is it because what we set up in our identity program 
is that really reality, if you will, kind of, yeah, just because people have access and you draw that into one view, does it actually mean that these people should have access? Yeah, so having, that's the way to, to, to just reduce your risk, right? To give yeah. them only what they need for, for them to do their work. You don't want to have everybody having access to everything just in case they will need it, right? Yeah, so having AI ML available to you to really give you that insight, to give you that look and to say, hey, here is what we're seeing and here's where the outliers are to sort of say, you know, hey, you know, there may be eight people in your organization that have access, but these other two people, they have far too much access because they have the same type of role and getting that kind of information. I mean, people used to spend years designing all these roles and whatever, and then when the design was done, the organization had changed and you could start again. <laughs> yeah. so, and sometimes and it's just a matter of people having access. They don't even know they have access. So their account becomes orphan. And that's the best way for hackers to come in and take over you know, uh, an account and start maneuvering around the organization. Very much so, kind of. So you know, what, what I think more than anything AI and ML can help is really giving that visibility that before didn't exist kind of if you will kind of and that really helps people um getting that visibility so giving spotting CISO outliers and spotting orphan accounts and things like that yeah right? absolutely. kind of uh, mm -hmm. you know but also giving them the confidence that you know your established policies are working as designed kind of, right mm -hmm. CISOs it's all about the uh, ease of mind if you will making sure that every control that you put in place is working as designed and AI and ML has really helped visualizing that, that that is working according to plan or telling you that things are not working according to plan. Right. So uh, the next question I want to take you um, to help uh, clarify a little bit how um, as a user of identity, you kind of look at the different categories within identity because identity has evolved, but it's also merging, right? The, the, the whole identity management has really three categories, right? There is the access management part, there is the identity governance, aka identity security now, and privilege access management. And you worked with all of them. Um, and, and, you know, you, 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 um, you had a, pr a, a very specific use for each of them and you understood the difference. So what, what, uh, what comments can you, uh, can you give to the audience to um, try to make sense of that landscape that's get becoming, the identity landscape that's becoming a little bit more um, blurry that's and confusing? Probably the, that's probably the right word I was going to use, yeah. It, it's yeah. definitely blurry between these three disciplines and there's a lot of talk in your in the um, analyst space and the press at the moment around the, the convergence of that mm -hmm. and you know if i look back in time and you know when we looked at first at security solutions you know if you look at the semantics and the mcafees of the world they were sort of the integrated solution kind of and that was people were recommending but most people in security, myself included, it's still probably the discussion around best of breed versus, you know, an integrated solution. The problem with an integrated solution is, you know, it, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% may be enough, but in certain industries, 80% is not enough. Mm -hmm. kind of, so they will always continue to choose best of breed and make that integration happen. So they each have their play. And yes, there is definitely blurring going on, but the best way probably to describe it is through an example. So let me give you an example on where, you know, people may be blind to certain access. So if you look at, you know, an identity provider that may integrate with AWS, for example, then what the identity provider does is you have your identity attributes, you have some roles, and basically in AWS, you map those groups that you're a member of to roles within AWS. So if you just look at that piece, then you may say, oh, that's great. I have full visibility in it. But then if you look within AWS and somebody makes a change in AWS to a certain permission, now all of a sudden that group has a lot more permission than you thought. Mm -hmm. The identity providers are completely blind to that. Where if you look at the identity, Governance solutions kind of, you know, we have full visibility into all those entitlements. So we know exactly what's going on in AWS and have that full visibility. 
So it's really a complementary to those solutions to give you that full visibility of what the user has access to and actually detect any changes in that environment as well. So it's very important that people understand the distinctions kind of, and sometimes, you know, you could be blind to that. You think you know it all, but there are definitely reasons why identity government solutions are there and providing that deep visibility. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I think that's always uh, important to remind because we're all going towards more simplicity, more uh, uh, velocity, right? And the convergence can be appealing, but when we really think about identity security, there's things that no matter how fast you want to go, no matter how you go, you cannot take shortcut on those. And I think uh, uh, some of the things that we do and provide are a part of that category. Um, last question for you, Paul, right? We It's the end of the year and uh, there's always a lot of projection on industries and so forth. And all the vendors are here to kind of uh, give their, the projection, but what's your vision for identity, right? You've been with this uh, category for so long. You've seen it evolving, right? Uh, based on the needs of, uh, of your companies also uh, through the technology that it was, uh, that it was uh, uh, providing and delivering. But, you know, if I ask you a little bit to be the visionary, because in a way that's where you're gonna help us now at sell point, right? Where do you see identity uh, uh, going? You're talking a lot about being the fabric of the security infrastructure and so forth. Tell us a little bit about that vision that you have and what it would look like in a few years. Sure. Um, I think the best way to describe it from a vision perspective is sort of how people look at a consumer identity. So if you look at people you know, in the consumer space, then they know everything about a, about a consumer, right? What, what they're buying, what they're doing, what they may be interested in, and the marketing around that is perfect. They know exactly how that's... It. On the identity side, we, we just don't have that 360 view yet, kind of, uh, right? So we need to move to get that 360 view. And part of that is, you know, the best way I see other people describing it that way is kind of like looking at Tesla as a self-driving car, kind of, can we get identity to do that self-governance kind of, you know, how far can we push that envelope kind of to get there by instead of having to ask for, hey, here you make a recommendation, but you know, if the, the guardrails are put in place, then why wouldn't you make that decision? Do for, it. For the the true so, autonomous identity, that's where you're talking. Yeah, absolutely, talking moving there. And, and that becomes also a key pillar of, as people move to zero trust, right? In a zero trust world, it's all around that identity, that identity and the information surrounding that identity is what, what access decisions are being made of. So making sure that that identity is fresh, is timely, is up to date, is critical in that. And that's why as we move from static models to more dynamic models, taking in a lot more data, external data from maybe a threat feed or things like that, to put that into the perspective gives us a complete view of that identity. So I see a lot more self-governance. I see a lot more visibility for organizations so that they can secure their organization, but also can, can ramp up that thing without having the necessary hire another four or five people to do that stuff. By really moving into that autonomous world allows them to, uh, to be fast and curious, if you will. Very good. Paul, thank you so much. Identity security it is, where it's all about rethinking identity. And um, 2021, we'll talk even more about identity security. Thank you so much for our perspective. It's a pleasure to have you on this program. And I'm very, very excited to have you at South Point to help us push the vision faster and better. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much.